Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? All right, thank you so much. So welcome to Diversity in Libraries, a class at the University of South Carolina School of Library and Information Science. I'm Nicole Cook, and I am the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair. And it, I am very pleased and proud to uh, be able to present the Baker Diversity Lecture Series, which is named in honor of Augusta Baker. And so we are continuing on with our lecture series, um, and it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome Holly Smith, a dear friend and colleague who is the college archivist at Spelman College. And Holly will be talking to us about her work uh, concerning diversity as it relates to archives uh, and some other very special projects. And before I turn it over to Holly, I just want to push a link in the chat box just so everyone has the link to the webpage for the diversity lecture series. And on that site, you'll find the readings that Holly recommended uh, for this session, and I would second that recommendation, some really good stuff there. And also after our session today, a video of today's lecture will be posted at that site as well. So without further ado, uh, welcome Holly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cook. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to say, and she did not pay me to say this, <laughs> but really just what it is a treat um, for you all to be able to learn from Dr. Cook and the wonderful colleagues in this series. So again, I'm honored to be included with so many um, colleagues whose work I like and respect and uh, some that I'd like to get to know more in depth. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. And so I am going to spend some time talking about my work at the Spelman College Archivist, but broadly, the work that I do, I consider myself an archivist, but again, a memory worker. And I'll go into more about what I really mean by that and what other colleagues mean in the sense of I think that's a term and terminology that we all can participate in, and it's broader um, as well. And I really do want to give us time for a discussion on some questions that I'll pose and go through. So again, I'll focus on my work at, at Spelman and some of the work that I do around outside of that, but particularly would like to engage in the discussion uh, really about um, what does it mean to document the stories of Black women and what does it mean to create equitable, accessible spaces within and without uh, external to the archives. So without further ado, I will get started. And um, as Dr. Cook said, there'll be questions at the end. I will also try to be mindful of paying attention to the chat if someone has a burning question <laughs> or um, while I'm talking or chatting, because I really would like this to be a discussion, not a soliloquy of just me talking. So if that sounds acceptable to everyone, I'll go ahead and get started. So first, I really want to focus and start with the first half of the title, Wholeness is No Trifling Matter. And that comes from, excuse me, a quote by um, iconic cultural worker, feminist filmmaker, who we'll talk a little bit more about later, Tony K. Bambara. So this is a quote from one of her most famous uh, famous books, a novel, where a particular a woman who does a lot of work in her community has come to a healer because she's exhausted and seeks not just a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. And the healer asked her, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well, just so as you're sure, sweetheart, and ready to be healed, because wholeness is no trifling matter, a lot of weight when you're well. And in addition to just being kind of really an iconic line, um, in a wonderful work, I think, again, it speaks to the work that we do as archivists. We're not trying to, I seek to not try to tell one encompassing story about Black women, the Black community, because they're diverse, but it's just something about being, I think, telling our collective stories, telling complicated stories, documenting diverse communities, particularly of Black women, that 
gives a healing to communities and all of us and can just create more whole encompassing stories. So with the spirit of Tony K, that's really where the idea of trying to work in collaboration to tell those stories really is no trifling matter. So just for our consideration, here are some of the discussion questions for today that will guide our conversation, but that I just really would like for us to be thinking about as I continue talking and as we um, you know, continue the conversation together. So again, what does it mean to tell quote unquote whole encompassing stories of black women? How, how does the Spelman Archive seek to tell these stories and create collaborative and not co-optive relationships with communities? What I'll really be seeking to try to tell you more about today. And finally, how can archives serve as liberatory spaces focused on equity and justice particularly for historically marginalized communities. So just um, something that I'd love for us to all be thinking about and we can discuss. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody's heard of Spelman College, <laughs> a little bit of bias here, but in case you haven't, I just wanted to share a little bit of information about Spelman College. So it was founded in 1881 as the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary. Um, the two founders were two women, Sophia Packard and Harriet Giles, who had done missionary work and traveled extension, extensively throughout the South and working in tandem with the Af uh, some of the African-American religious and civic communities um, and with funding secured from the uh, Rockefeller family founded the um, seminary. It actually became Spelman College in 1924, um, named after the um, Rockefeller, a grandparent of Rockefeller's wife's grandparent were abolitionists. And it was founded with the specific intent to educate women of the African diaspora as well. So in terms about the archives um, on Spelman's campus, is everyone still with me? I always get it. Sometimes it's funny, you know, when you're talking online and you can't hear the affirmative mm-hmms and yes and mm-hms. <laughs> So thank you for saying yes, because sometimes you're like, I really hope I'm not talking into a void, but I know, thank you, Professor Cook and everyone. I, I suspect I would get a notification. So thank you all for that affirmation. So again, just the to talk a little bit about the Spelman College Archives. So Spelman has always documented its history, I would say, um, but the formal archive space wasn't established and created until 19, um, the building we're in now uh, was created, the Camille Cosby Academic Center building. So the space we occupy now on the second floor of that building opened in 96. But um, we are part of the Women's Resource and Research Center. So for those of you, again, who might not uh, be familiar with uh, Spelman and the historically black colleges in Atlanta, there is a consortia of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities called what's known as the Atlanta University Center, which consists of Spelman, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta University, uh, Morehouse School of Medicine and uh, Morris Brown as well. So there is a library that services all the schools in the Atlanta University Center or the AUC as you'll hear me refer to it. So that library also has an archives um, that we work closely with. So at Spelman, there is not an individual library because I know typically we see libraries in academic um, spaces as well. I just want to make that distinction, um, but we are part of the Women's Research and Resource Center, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. So we're the institutional repository for the college. Um, so we of course document the college, its constituents, faculty, students, staff, um, but we also are a special collection. And by that, we document women of the African diaspora broadly, particularly in the areas of social justice, Black feminist theory, um, LGBTQ advocacy, civil rights, human rights. So that is part of our charge, is part of the Women's Center. So again, this is one of the, um, I would say certainly in my working experiences, but again, the rare treat where not having to justify why documenting black women is important and where documenting black women broadly is the mission 
and our continued mission of the university. So the Women's Resource and Research Center, if you're not familiar, was founded in 1981 by um, iconic Black feminist scholar, Dr. Beverly Gosheftal, who you'll see there to my right, who was, who was actually reading The Black Woman by Tony K. Van Barr to um, students at a program. So the Women's Resource and Research Center houses the, um, ah, thank you, Kylie. Yes, so you can link to the program there. And it houses a comparative women's studies program, but really a lot of the radical progressive activity on campus comes out of the Women's Center. There's a ton of programs um, around community outreach as well as engagement. There's actually a program held in honor of Tony K. Bambara um, throughout the semester on Fridays, what's known as the Tony K. Bambara Scholar Activist Collective, where different community members, scholars, activists, organizers, will come and speak to, you know, whoever's interested, students and scholars. And my colleague over who oversees that, Dr. Bahati Kumba, the associate director, always says pizza and knowledge will be served. And also the Women's Resource and Research Center um, houses some of the more progressive radical student organizations, such as Afrikiti, the LGBTQ student organization, and the Feminist Majority um, Leadership Alliance, as well as others. So it's really a fantastic treat for me selfishly. <laughs> and I think for the archives with Dr. Gashefta really having and conceiving the idea of keeping the archives at Spelman, that we are connected with the Women's Center and Women's Studies program to help facilitate research by and about Black women as well. So I'd like to share quickly a little bit more information about um, some of our collections. So Oh, and I realized I, um, pardon me, I neglected, I inadvertently omitted a slide, but just kind of going through some of the um, records that we have, we certainly have like records of all the presidents in terms of institutional records, different offices, um, and these different publications that we get heavy use from and that I'm glad that will be available now more broadly in a grant project I'll mention briefly later. So everything from student newspapers to the yearbooks and um, this is just an overview of some of the more heavily used publications as well as the SAGE Journal. Now, the SAGE Journal, co-edited by Dr. Guy Sheffall and uh, Dr. Patricia Bell Scott, was, if I may say, I don't think I'm over speaking that, but I believe the first journal that focused specifically around Black feminist theory and thinking. And it was published twice a year from 84 to 95. I think there are about 10 issues and there would be a number of just critical reviews, essays by students on a variety of issues. So it's a really uh, rare and wonderful resource, again, centering the experiences of women of the African diaspora, which that too is thankfully has been digitized and online. And if I mention anything that I say has been digitized but can't provide the link, I'll share that with uh, Dr. Cook and you can, you're more than welcome to email me um, directly if you like. So one of the things that um, I'm proud of all our collections, but most excited about, and that I would say is certainly our most heavily used collection are the papers of um, lesbian feminist activist, Audre Lorde. If you're all familiar with um, Audre Lorde uh, writing Zami, another spelling of my name, the Cancer Journals, just to name a few of her publications. And uh, that collection came to Spelman really because of Audre Lorde's relationship with Dr. Johnetta Cole who was the first uh, black woman president of Spelman College in the late 80s, which kind of surprises people actually. But again, the paper, it's quite, uh, the collection is quite voluminous, um, correspondence, drafts, um, at course materials, photographs of her time in Berlin, Germany, her family. Um, and so we have researchers around the world who come in to utilize that collection for a variety of uses. Also, uh, one of my favorite, uh, you'll hear me say that a lot, <laughs> collections and one that gets heavily used are the papers of Tony K. Bambara, which we are also very fortunate to have, um, who is a feminist writer. I mentioned the Black Woman briefly that was published in 1970, a collection of essays uh, by cultural workers, musicians, feminist writers um, that was really iconic for its time. 
And the collection is really rich in terms of correspondence, again, drafts, scripts, and also treatments of, um, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, treatments of film that she did, rough edits. We have quite a number of AV material. Um, and I call Tony Cave and Barr an archivist because she was meticulous as a researcher for her, whether it was her fiction, nonfiction, or her films. So there are tons of research notes for her various writing and film projects. So now I'm gonna go a little bit, I've shared you know, about the collections we have. I'd like to go more specific into some of the specific work that I get to partake in as the college archivist, myself and my colleague, Cassandra Ware. We're a small but mighty team of two here in the archives, but we have three great students. And um, just to really talk about some of the ways that we really seek to amplify the voices of women of the African diaspora through the archives, but also to engage students, community members in rich and uh, meaningful ways. And what does that um, look like? Are there any, um, well, I can continue on, but I just wanted to have a pause for a minute to see if there were any burning questions at the moment or, um, also, just to give myself a pause to have a little sip of some water, please excuse me. Okay, thank you. Not not yet. So, and thank you all for your graciousness uh, to allow me to just have a um, sip of water. So, when I um, came, I've been at Spelman since 2014, which I might have neglected to say as the college archivist in that time. And as the college archivist, like I mentioned, we are a small staff, two full-time members, but I will say because of that, I do get to participate not only in the administrative planning and long-term maintenance of the archival collections, but really get to do a lot of various things. And again, work very closely with students, faculty, and staff, and community members, which is very important to me to not be too disconnected from, the com from communities, from people, as well as the materials. So one of the things that we started to do was an Archive Speaks lecture series. Well, I say lecture series, really more of a discussion series because it's not always necessarily a lecture or a panel. But again, that the point and goal there was to center discussions uh, of research by and about Black women um, as it relates to the Spelman collections, but even broader than just Spelman. So you see there all the way to the right, I am with um, a wonderful colleague, Dr. Aisha Johnson-Jones, who just came out with a fantastic uh, book on the Julius uh, Rosenwald School Library Fund. Yes, as Professor Cook said, amazing book, really pathbreaking research. And she was able to come and to speak to the students, which was just a really rich experience for them to not only hear about her work, but as a graduate of an HBCU who went to grad school, it's very meaningful for the group of predominantly young Black women to see another Black woman who has gone through the PhD program. She was offering you know, advice and counsel to the students. So that was just a really rich experience. And at the top, um, Dr. Valerie Boyd, who is editing um, in the Alice Walker's journals and works very closely with Ms. Walker, spoke about her work in the archives and research, um, which again was a really rich, great program. And again, these programs are open to the public and anyone who has an interest in archives as well. So we do quite a bit of course instruction well, um, and I would say with departments that, you know, you have some that it seems more typical that you might do course instruction with, particularly for students doing arc, uh, assignments around archives or again, to really increase primary source literacy, um, such as English and history. But we have worked very closely, I'm excited to say, particularly the last few semesters with the art and visual culture department, as well as dance and theater. So. The picture you see there on your right, um, my colleague standing, Professor Yasmin Espert, and with her intro to the object course, where, and the students are trained around 
certainly curatorial pedagogy because there is a curatorial studies program at Spelman College. I believe the first of its kind at a historically black college or university. So we have a really rich, robust curatorial studies program. So what the students were doing in that particular class were really reading um, archives and objects. And we didn't give them any context. You know, after some uh, a particular course instruction session, they came back for two sessions with the archives. It just really had just a really rich for me and a, from based on the conversation with the students, a rich engagement with the items that we have the actual archival documents, photographs, but also some of the objects that we have in our collection. And I would have to say um, the students that we work with, whether it's at Spelman, other schools in the um, Atlanta University Center, or even we do work with other faculty and staff um, beyond that, are just really excited, interested, intrigued to see archives created by and about Black women, whether it's, again, the objects, the yearbooks. It's just something about that experience of the centering of women of the African diaspora and the communities we inhabit that really, I think, draw the attention of uh, students as well as faculty. We've had a number of students come back into the archives for their own creative work. Um, I've had students stop by and they just want to see something really old. As one student told me, yeah, like from the 70s. I was like, hmm, wait a minute, <laughs> got my toe on the 70s. But in all seriousness, just to have the students really want to engage in creative ways with archives and to quote another sister colleague of ours, um, Skylar Hearn, I mentioned the word activating the archives, um, a concept that I think is really important because I think historically in the archives and archives profession, we're kind of seen as passive keepers of quote unquote dead records. But really thinking a more activist approach, we are facilitators to items, documents, objects whose meaning and context and really relation change over time to different communities. And what does it mean when someone comes in and again utilizes archives or photographs for a performance piece, for a theater piece, for not just a paper, in a sense that activates. And that's particularly important when we think about historically marginalized communities in the archival record, where a lot of times our stories are not always in repositories. We've had to embody our experiences, through whether it's quilts or memories or oral histories. So I think that course instruction particularly is one particular way to extend that ideology to uh, students in meaningful ways. All right, and I want to be mindful of time here as well. So, um, and I'll stay on this briefly and go to the next slide. So when I was mentioning our publications earlier, um, the Spelman archives, along with our partners that are listed there on the top of the page, were able to receive a Council of Library and Information uh, resource or a CLEAR grant, uh, hidden collections grant to digitize, um, as you'll see over there, almost 800,000 <laughs> pages of items and catalogs and theses and dissertations um, and make those available to the public. So this was a three-year project, and there were project directors based out of Digital Public Library of Georgia, as well as AUC Woodruff. Um, they aided in the digitization, as well as the metadata creation for the objects, and the online portal, which I will show you momentarily for the um, collection. And so we've done a lot around making sure people know about this really wonderful resource. Um, in addition to our colleagues at the HBCU Library Alliance, um, this is really an iconic, what's the word I'm trying to say? Certainly not the first time, but just an important um, project in terms of making uh, materials from diverse HBCUs accessible online. And here's the page for the collection. If you just Google Our Story AUC, it'll come up. And again, I'm happy to share this uh, link with Dr. Cook for the website if that's helpful. But again, you can download um, the publications and photos. You can do keyword searches within the, um, because they've been um, OCR. Thank you, Benjamin. Yep, so there's the link. And so 
just a fantastic resource that has really been beneficial, particularly if people cannot get make it to the um, archives to do the research. So again, as a true Southerner and talker, I am uh, taking my time, but I'll go a little quickly through these slides to give us time for robust discussion. Another uh, project we participate on, again, thinking about just getting beyond the archives and disseminating this information. My colleague who I mentioned, Dr. Kumba, oversees a conference based around the leg and legacy, feminist legacy of Tony K. Bambara. It used to be yearly, now it's biennium, but it's in Tony K.'s honor, again, situating the life and work and research by and about Black women. And because we have Tony K. Bambara's papers, but also the papers of Audre Lorde and other materials related to Black women uh, feminists, Dr. Kumba has been really wonderful and instrumental about incorporating the archives into the conference. In the last several years, there's either been a plenary or some sort of conversation around what does it mean to archive Black women? What, is, what does it mean to understand the identity of Black women and document our experience? And students are very involved in, um, excuse me, very involved in the formation of the conference. And I just want to mention briefly in terms we work very closely with different student groups as well in terms of wanting to document the experiences of students at um, not just a top down view. So we are very intentional about that and we are part of a larger initiative called Project Stand, which again, you can see the link and I'm happy to share that um, with Kylie and, um, and again, I know Dr. Cook. Um, knows this great work as well. So that again really centers around documenting student activism broadly. And please do check out the website when you get a chance. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Cook. It, it's overseen by a wonderful sister colleague, Leo Hughes Watkins. And there's been a symposia kind of spread across the country to try to reach students and communities broadly. So that's another initiative I'm really proud that we're part of. And so lastly, <laughs> one of the things that I've, um, well, not lastly, one more thing after that, but quickly, that I've been excited to remain in is a conversation and advocacy work around the theory of radical empathy in the archives. So if you're all familiar with the um, article by Michelle Caswell and Marika Cypher that um, I quote from there, from Human Rights to Feminist Ethics, Radical Empathy in the Archives, you can see what the focus of their theory really is, using a feminist ethics of care to broadly um, kind of reconfigure the way that we think about our relationship to not only records, but a number of mutual affective responsibilities. And what I really like, I think they articulate um, very powerfully in a lot of ways, a lot of things that a lot of us have been interested in doing, particularly in the communities we um, work in, and particularly having had the experience, the passion, the desire to work with uh, within diverse African American communities, really about building relationships, collaborative relationships. So um, the, this is an overview of the effective archival responsibilities that are outlined in the article. So there are four outlined in the article that you can see up here. And through working with some sister comrades for a presentation in uh, Society of American Archivists in 2017, we thought of another one, which is at the very bottom, um, really the relationship that we have between each other and how do we hold space and support each other. So, um, and working with my sister colleagues, not only on the presentation, but really just diving deeper into what does it really mean to have radical empathy in our profession, which might seem kind of counterintuitive to the work we do, again, might seem strange to think about building these relationships. But again, it's right on time, particularly for me thinking of dealing and working with records as well as building relationships with communities that have been historically marginalized in the archives. So here is a fantastic picture <laughs> of myself and some of my sister archives and comrades who presented at the um, annual meeting. And just again, just a, 
a really rich conversation that each of us who are in different institutions and working in different ways were able to speak about how we employed these theories and other ideas um, in our work. So we continue to engage. I know several of my colleagues, such as Kelly Wooten, who's at Duke in the bottom right, um, has given um, presentations, as well as my other sister colleague, uh, Elvia Royal Ramirez and Jasmine Jones and other uh, sister colleagues in that picture have presented and done workshops in conjunction with Michelle and Marika as well. And there will be a forthcoming issue of the Journal of Critical Library and Information Studies focused on um, radical empathy as well, um, likely the early spring. So please stay tuned for that. And last, definitely not least, but closest to my heart is really personally making sure to stay involved with other sister colleagues and publishing around Black women in archives, particularly about, I would say, not only the work we do in communities, as well as the collections themselves, but also being comfortable and seeing it as an asset to bring our own identities and intersectional identities um, into the conversation. So I had the fantastic opportunity to present with um, my sister colleague, Skylar Hearn, who is wearing the um, green dress in the picture, and Shawnee Moraine, who is all the far left. That's our colleague, uh, Megan, who is not pretend participating, but um, attended the conference at a 2017 African American Librarians Conference. And our sister colleague, Shaitra Powell, who was unable to actually attend the conference, but was also on the panel, we uh, initiated the idea and we talked about what would it really mean to write an article as for Black women memory workers who see it as an asset to bring our identities and our experiences into the work that we do, not to essentialize and say there's one quote unquote Black experience or one experience as a Black woman, but seeing how you can bring your total self and your diverse components of your identity that will strengthen relationship within those communities, um, external to those communities, and really help build more collaborative relationships. So we were very excited and proud to be um, have our piece featured in the Kula Journal that you can see the link there. And again, I'll send the link. Thank you, Nicole. Really means a lot to have the support of Professor Cook and others, uh, colleagues whose own writing um, and work and continued research influences us. So. I think that is also something I feel extremely um, motivated and important to do to keep writing and researching, researching and publishing and working collaboratively. And when I say that, you know, we can talk some more about some of the other, um, whether it's programming in the community or some of the other relationships that we're building, but it's really important. And again, I see it as an asset to be able to bring my whole self um, to this work which I think can only enhance us personally and professionally, um, but as well as being self-aware enough to, you know, just to be able to be self-aware as an individual as, as well as professional as you continue to do that work. So these are just, uh, to wrap up, just a little bit of information about areas uh, that we like to focus on in the archives to continue to connect with and document uh, to work with as well. And just again, briefly of some of the continued strategies really for outreach and advocacy for the college and the um, archives particularly. Um, just really thinking about long-term sustainable preservation, but really again about advocacy and access. So we can just continue to support long-term engagement with the collections, um, and Spelman as a whole. And so finally, <laughs> here is my contact information. So I, I really um, am looking forward to our conversation and discussion. And if you have any questions about the Spelman archives, what we do, any inquiries about the profession or just want to chat, I am very open to being contacted. And again, I just extend a, a warm thank you and ton of appreciation to Professor Cook for this opportunity today. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Marvelous as always. 
Um, we have lots of time for questions and discussion. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the box and we will get our conversation started. Holly, while folks are thinking about their questions, um, in your presenting, in your writing, in your work, uh, building on radical empathy, have you encountered anyone who uh, has maybe perhaps pushed back or doesn't think that radical empathy is necessary? And I ask that because, you know, sometimes we get these types of reactions uh, for, for those of us who work uh, explicitly for diverse and marginalized populations and you know folks will say oh it's not 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 necessary you're sensitive etc cetera, etc cetera. no thank you Nicole. that's a great question and I believe it was my um, sister colleague Elvia who I, I haven't directly received any um, kind of pushback of uh, radical empathy and I think Michelle and Marika themselves have you know acknowledged that there are certain limitations which I think any um good theorists would do <laughs> um but elvia had mentioned somebody said well how is radical empathy different than regular empathy mm. and i felt like my answer to that is we can all be empathetic um which i mean i do think it's a skill to be empathetic to really understand and you know truly understand and try to not just sympathy right but really be empathetic to understanding what an individual a uh, community has worked with, but I think just really the idea, radical sometimes has a bad connotation for people, mm -hmm. but to me, to truly love something means you want to change it. And what I really like about the term radical empathy in the archives with feminist ethics is it allows us to really not only truly try to understand and empathize with people, but to really radically reimagine our, our own individual thinking, our collective thinking, our training, and to address that behavior through actions, through tangible actions and rela building relationships, or maybe it's changing a collection development policy or being transparent and having conversation, you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So to me, what I think has been really innovative and helpful and again, through your own work, Nicole, it's not just about having the conversations, it's being mm -hmm. self-aware enough to re recognize our own privileges and biases mm -hmm. and to be able to check them in meaningful ways and to, you know, also be able to certainly with love, but <laughs> call them out or adjust them as, as needed and to also to be able to address structural as well as professional inequities or things that we encounter. So that was a long answer to your question, but I think that's, and again, just kind of having the language around some things I felt myself really fighting for and doing in other positions and other institutions I've worked in, it's been really helpful to have this framework along with so many others who like exactly like you said, go do that type of work. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. So there's a comment. Um, Alana says, I really appreciate the term memory worker. Having worked in a collection where the documents were of a marginalized group, it's such a better description of the work. Thank you, Alana. I, I first heard Skyla and then our other colleague, comrade Jared Drake mention it, um, you know, broadly in the work we do. And I really, I like it too, because I think it unites us whether you, you know, are archivist, a librarian, a public history, or whether you had no, you know, didn't attend the program and when we're all engaged in this this type of documentation commemoration. It just, I don't know, I, I like it too. <laughs> and I think it's unifying in a way that can just kind of bring us together. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? I know that was a lot. <laughs> Holly, you mentioned stuff. the um, Archive Speaks discussion series and that it's open to Spelman College and the public. Is there a way to attend digitally or is there more information you could give about that program? Sure, absolutely. And we have not recorded them yet. And I'm sorry, who's this talking? 
It was Kaylee. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, Kaylee, thank you. Um, that's a, you know, that actually brings that back to the mind. Maybe we should record these <laughs> and put them up online. Um, because it would be a nice way to, you know, have people to be able to attend them. So we have done at least one a semester. Um, one year was just really challenging to pull together, but they have been local as well as, you know, it, it's been like Aisha Johnson Jones, a colleague who's in Atlanta, but as well, we had um, a speaker from New York who was coming in and working with Beverly, who was talking about the Shirley Chisholm Grassroots Archive Project in New York. Dr. Winslow, excuse me, I left her. And that was the first one we did. And Shirley Chisholm was actually a scholar in residence here for about a year. Um, gosh, was that 81? Which I can't even imagine Shirley Chisholm being on the ground um, <laughs> walking, and I'm assuming everybody's familiar, certainly with Congresswoman Shirley um, Chisholm, ran for president, just an iconic Black woman legislator. So we were able to pull some of the things from her time here, and we've been trying to do that as it relates to, not force it, but with each speaker, um, if there's some sort of tie or connection or connectivity to actually try to, you know, pull some materials to have to make that connection with the, you know, stories and with the Spelman archives, if possible. So we do have one coming up in March with another colleague, Dr. Danielle Phillips Cunningham, who looks at um, around, certainly uh, thinking around Black women, but around, if I'm not mistaken, issues around domesticity and um, advocacy. And she utilized the um, archives here. And she's a Spelman alum. So that's just a really <laughs> nice tie in there. But um, that's a really good point, Kaylee. So I'm going to think about upcoming how we can make those kinds of conversations more accessible, maybe by recording and posting them. Other questions or comments? And while folks are thinking, um, Holly, I'll ask you what's next in terms of projects on the horizon, writing on the horizon, uh, or maybe, you know, just things you, you uh, want to get to at some point? Because yeah. I know you have lots of free time. <laughs> right, right. It, it, it's just so many good ideas and all these things. Um, but thank you for that question, Nicole. I'm really um, invested in continuing to not, not only just work with our students to get different archives, um, you know, archival material here, but what I found very, I guess, kind of particularly exciting and refreshing is that some students have approached us uh, unsolicited about working with them in various capacities on different projects. Um, so one particularly young, brilliant student, there's so many of them, but she wants to start a podcast where to really um, in our ode to Ida B. Wells, the red record called the um, blue record, Mm. And to have, you know, like interview, but she really wants to engage the archives in terms of not only materials, but subject matter, just a lot of things. And so I was like, absolutely. <laughs> and again, that she, uh, I had worked with Kayla before um, on some of her own research, but I don't know, that was just particularly exciting. So really excited in that way. And we've got some really exciting collections coming in which I'm really excited about and thinking about issue, uh, you know, ways to really engage people around these collections. And, and one in particular is going to be really rich and encompassing from a colleague who's been in theater for decades. So particularly thinking about processing that and making that accessible, because we've got some really large ones, but really rich ones coming in um, that I'm really going to be excited how we can leverage and engage around whether it's programming, symposia, and let's see, Nicole, so many things, right? <laughs> um, another connection I'm particularly excited about is with a friend and colleague, Christy Jackson, who is the chair of what's known as the Conservancy at Historic Washington Park. Mm -hmm. So Washington Park is an actual historic park, African-American park, um, founded with land from Heman Perry, who was um, 
wealthy African American man, rare, you know, thinking early 20th century, but because of, you know, segregation policies, but for the Washington um, Park neighborhood, wanted to create a recreational space for African Americans. So the park still exists. Um, there are still members of the original neighborhood, although with gentrification and shifts, people are being forced out, leaving. So Christy just does a ton to oversee the physical maintenance of the park while preserving the history. So we're partnering with some of our colleagues in the, there's a social justice fellows program. It's felt it's very active and involved. Um, the Bonner Scholars Program that does community engagement in ways, you know, around programming, but supporting Christy and, and helping her arrange physical documents that community members have given her, but also ways to leverage support for her. And this is kind of what I was getting at thinking of how we can, you know, get beyond just our walls <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of really making substantive uh, relationships with organizations and individuals. Um, because just because we're at HBCU in historically African American neighborhood within historically African American neighborhoods doesn't mean people feel welcome or open to come mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. There's a physical gate, and you know, right. <laughs> and then there's let alone you know um, emotional, structural, you know, all types of other barriers. So with that being said, um, this is just you know, one of the many collaborations that I'm really interested in helping to nurture and flourish for the long term um, to be able to support, you know, and the park is literally 10 minutes from Spelman. Mm -hmm. Yet I don't know to the degree, I certainly didn't know about the park until I've been here for about two years and I don't know that to, to the degree other students know about it, but there's so much, I think, Ty, you had alumni who, you know, live in the neighborhood, faculty, staff, you know, went to the AUC. Um, there's just so many ties and connections. So anyway, long answer again to your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. And, it, you know, um, also for the uh, South Carolina students in this class, um, particularly those who uh, may be local to Columbia, we have um, great access uh, to several HBCUs, including Benedict, Allen, uh, Claflin is not too far. Um, Wonderful. And, yeah, and these are places with, you know, really rich history and, you know, um, they need help too, right? So, you know, if folks are looking for internships or projects or volunteering, um, I would encourage you to do that. You know, one of the, the examples that came not too long ago, uh, is South Carolina State University, which is another HBCU uh, in Orangeburg. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Clyburn's widow, uh, excuse me, Clyburn's wife, uh, Emily, just passed not too long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and they were both students at South Carolina State, and he really wanted to uh, donate her papers and effects to South Carolina State. And they really wanted them, but they were um, astute enough to realize they didn't have the resources. Uh, mm. to, to be able to process uh, these effects in a way that would make them accessible to the public because he really wants her story to be told. Mm -hmm. So um, it was lucky for us, he then came to the University of South Carolina. She was a, an alum from the library school. So we still have, you know, those ties, um, you know, but to Holly's point about making things accessible, uh, stories that we may not ordinarily know, um, because we don't have is enough connection um, with these really rich resources and community groups, uh, universities, colleges, et cetera. No, and that's great to hear. Nicole. I mean, I, I'm just, and again, not putting all, you know, onus on you, certainly, because that's exhausting <laughs> for the people who call, we can't do that, but just, yes, yes. right, and nor should we, but mm -hmm. just having you there, you know, and to really be able to amplify her um, life and story in that way and to, mm -hmm. you know, build a collaborative relationship, hopefully, with the um, with the archives, with the, uh, you know, university, mm -hmm. it, that would be so meaningful. And I think that's something else, you know, I feel particularly passionate about um, supporting our colleagues at um, small institutions, particularly HBCUs, you mm -hmm. know, because there are you know, wonderful caring professionals that often sometimes find themselves without the resources or right. the structures or right. sometimes institutional support. Um, but these, these, you're not going to be able to find the materials like you said anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll get off that soapbox, but just, you know, <laughs> feeling really passionate about making sure HBCUs and archives can have the resources um, and staff and support that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and kind of, you know, related to that, um, can you talk a little bit about um, how someone becomes an archivist? Um, you know, everyone can't be the archivist at Spelman College, but, um, you know, if, if, if someone is interested in pursuing this work, particularly the work that um, really emphasizes and preserves the work of marginalized populations. So the first part would be, you know, how do they get on that path? Um, and, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, it depends on what you're listening to or reading about, you know, there aren't any jobs in archives, right? So I hear that sometimes as well. Um, yeah. You know, and so what, what does that kind of landscape kind of look like? And, and what should they be studying uh, to best prepare for this role? No, absolutely. And uh, thank you for that question. I um so I, I did go through Simmons. I, I it's weird to say university. <laughs> yeah. Because I was well back in the day when it was a college and I did do the archival management concentration there. Um, which was helpful because I certainly did have library courses, but was able to really, you know, focus in on the theory and the practices and you know, take courses that were helpful. Um I will say I know just based on my own personal interest and desire, I really had a desire to work with African American collections, either at a you know historic African American institution or an institution where that was one of the primary focuses. Now, like Professor Cook was saying, it's not that I necessarily saw a job or knew of a job or had a title of a job. I just knew that was my area of interest and really try to, you know, find, we were able to, you know, pick our internship sites in the program. So while I was in Boston, for example, one of the sites I was able to enter was Northeastern University. It has a really rich, diverse number of collections in their special collections, um, which was a pleasant surprise. So I think that was helpful in that regard to, be able to talk to my advisor and to seek that experience. Um, but I think also thinking in terms of Professor Hook's question, I certainly was able to read in terms of library and archive theory, which is helpful by people that I know and respect. <laughs> some of us, some of them are on this call right now. <laughs> but also the work I would say of other, again, thinking about particularly wanting to work in African-American collections, but also, the work and writings and just knowing more about black bibliophiles. <laughs> Porter Wesley, you know, reading about Vivian Harsh and some of those, mm -hmm. you know, some of, uh, you know, the my um, intellectual ancestors to really know the, the breadth and richness and types of collections that were out there. I would also say another thought thing that really, you know, kind of helped me professionally was so, you know, knowing I want to work in that environment, there actually was a job that came out at UNC Chapel Hill that was focused on African American material culture. Now, exactly like Professor Cook was saying, it was a term job, which you'll see a lot of archives, I think introductory positions might be term pro a project related year two, sometimes three. Um, which can be challenging, but sometimes in the good way, like let's say you get that experience and maybe you decide you're ready to move on <laughs> or, you know, you know, in institutions, maybe, you know, they'll be able to invest longer. But I think that was a really helpful experience for me to um, have. A, it was a two year term. But I ended up being there five years. Mm. And I think it really taught me some valuable lessons in a good, positive way about the need to be clear and transparent when you're working in any community, but it particularly, you, I'm not born and raised from North Carolina. And I really strongly encourage, just, just to not be assumed, just because I'm black, <laughs> doesn't mean that I'm gonna stroll up into, you know, one of the many African-American neighborhoods in Chapel Hill 
to think that, you know, to have the humor uh -huh. and the right, vanity right. to think I'm going to stroll up, nor did I feel like I want to be used in that way. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I did find myself in certain circumstances where like, well, you're the black person, go talk to them black people about that black stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, to be mm -hmm. fully transparent. Mm -hmm. So what I think is important in building relationships, particularly in communities where you might not, not identify, but also just that you don't know much about is really listening. Right. learning and truly I'm not going I, I had no desire nor did I ever and I was glad to really build some substantive relationships with um, different individuals and organizations while I was in Chapel Hill but I had no desire to just come in tell people what to do with their materials say you need to put it at Chapel Hill because that's the best place not at all I did not want to be used in that fashion mm -hmm. nor did that ascribe my own personal politics so I think just treating people with compassion and respect and transparency. So again, if you are a white archivist and you have predominantly, let's say you have, you know, some rich collections related to various African American communities at your institution, but as UNC does and did, you know, have some very um, horrible relations with surrounding communities, just being open and transparent, understanding is a good first step because I think people just really appreciate not being condescended to. Right. right. And appreciate people who sincerely want to build relationships broadly around, you know, initiatives, programming, other collect collecting initiatives. So again, I know that was a long answer, but that is something I feel mm -hmm. really strongly about is to arm yourself with knowledge about the institution and communities you want to, but go out and actually build relationships with people based on um, openness, transparency, and trust, because people will, you know, see through that no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. No, spot on. Absolutely. And then what I'm hearing you say as part of that is that humanity and also radical listening are part of this process. Yes, yes, absolutely, Professor. And I feel uh, it's unfortunate sometimes when we're not able to have these conversations, whether it's at our professional organization, they get dismissed as soft skills or not as important as that right. to metadata and cataloging, uh -huh. but they certainly are. These are essential skills. These are life skills like that I feel like not only the type of archivist, but what kind of person do you want to be mm -hmm. and move like in this world? So I think that's why I really see a commitment to the communities I come from, but the ancestors to do this work and that keeps me humbled and focused. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm able to be a conduit to the work that we, you know, all do um, through those things, exactly like you said, like radical listening, coalition building, uh, using these feminist ethics of care, then I feel like that would make me, you know, as a good person and then tangentially a good archivist. <laughs> and on that mic drop. <laughs> Everyone, please join me in thanking Holly for spending some time with us today. Um, always enlightening. I'm always fascinated to see and hear about what you're working on. Um, Holly is uh, just such a great resource and doing oh. such amazing things. And it's always good to hear what's going on in those archives. So thank you so much again. Um, hope to see you in person soon so we can talk more about Radical Empathy. Absolutely. And I know, again, I'm not on the payroll, but you all, it's a treat to be able to <laughs> learn from Dr. Cook. She's been an amazing friend, a mentor, colleague. And so it truly is an honor to be on the program, yes. <laughs> so to speak, with so yes, many other always, people always I respect. Program. So I am excited to partake of the rest of the lectures myself. And really, if anyone needs anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right, everyone. So this concludes uh, our lecture for today. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I know we had some guests um, and for the folks in the class, always happy to see you all. So everyone have a good night and we will convene again next week for the next session in our lecture series. Have a good evening.